in your note, you kind of highlight the Fed could make one of two policy mistakes, perhaps more possibly going to see them uh, maybe uh, repeat maybe the issues we saw back in the taper tantrum. So, I mean, it sounds difficult, but where do you see this playing out, uh, especially as volatility is expected ahead? Well, if you think about it, the Fed could make a policy mistake in two ways. One, they could tighten prematurely. I think that that's not likely at all. So that leaves the other path for a policy mistake. And that could be they could let things run too hot from that standpoint, kind of continue to inflate perhaps a bubble in asset prices and really cause a potential risk for markets down the line. Now, this morning, CPI came in kind of below, well, it came in in line with expectations, but year over year numbers were just 1.4%. So continues to suggest a very benign inflationary environment. Yet what's interesting, Zach, is that break-even rates are creeping up higher and higher, north of 2%. All this suggests is that investors are expecting 2% or more inflation per year for the next 10 years. We're not even close to that. And the Fed has suggested they're going to let the economy and inflation run hot. So you could see that another kind of asset bubble begin to form. And, and really, the ride up is fun. It's exhilarating. But when it pops, when it bursts, it can be problematic. Michael, we had a guest on earlier who said that just the opposite, which is that his concern is that inflation is coming fast, much faster than you anticipate. But to your point, we're still at 1.4%. Uh, we've seen this really healthy debate that's come through on the issue of how inflationary President Biden's uh, stimulus package is likely to be. Which side do you stand on? And what are those who are saying inflation is the big risk? What are they getting wrong? There's still a lot to kind of consider in terms of the stimulus, and, and the jury's still out in a lot of ways. Maybe it's a little funny I use jury as we're doing the impeachment trial. But I think, at least in the near term, there's cyclical parts of inflation measures that remain fairly benign. So rents are certainly not picking up speed. The labor market continues to be uh, challenged. So you know, unemployment, jobless claims remain elevated. So you're not seeing that flow through on wages per se. Things like the output gap remain wide. So things like capacity utilization still are low. Those all need to improve dramatically in order to see inflation. And then you, know, you see that the, there's structural kind of longer term challenges to inflation. You know, rising debt, wider deficits as a result of that growing debt, aging demographics, which limits consumption or puts a weight on it and the disinflationary forces of technology. So I think both the cyclical and secular make it hard to make the case that inflation is going to run too hot anytime soon. And, and just quickly, the Fed, if you look at their summary of economic projections, they don't anticipate the, the inflation rising above 2% over the long term. So the stimulus is a question mark. Will it finally unleash that pent up demand? I'm not so sure. Yeah, Michael, the other thing, too, I mean, we've talked a lot about froth and, you know, people throw the bubble word around. We'll, we'll say froth in some areas of the market, whether you look at IPO names, uh, SPACs or even the cannabis uh, side of the market, which we've been discussing here. Uh, for investors out there looking to play this, I mean, is it smarter to maybe play those names that have been beaten down? I know you highlight maybe the aerospace and defense opportunities here. Boeing still down by about 40 percent. Uh, when you look back a year, talk to me about if, if that makes more sense, if there is kind of risks of froth, maybe you just play those beaten down names. What's your take? So one of the things that's interesting is if you buy into this idea that interest rates and inflation are going to rise as the economy and earnings rebound, and we can put the pandemic behind us. So under that scenario, you have interest rates rising. That poses three risks to asset allocation to portfolios. One, it impacts your valuations, particularly on your growth names. The second thing it does is it weighs on your bonds, your fixed income investments. And third is the correlation, the, the, the way these things move in tandem has shifted due to all these central bank distortions. And so what's interesting here is in order to combat that, one of the things to do is invest in things that are not correlated, kind of your anti-bonds. And Zach, what's interesting here is that is your cyclical value sectors and industries. It's your dividend payers, it's your financials, it's value, it's energy uh, companies. And those are the things that are catching a bid. So I do anticipate over the next 12 to 18 months, as the economy and earnings recover and the pandemic gets pushed behind us, that some of these reflationary trades 
will be maintain market leadership. But when you look at a company like Boeing, um, you certainly make the case that sure, when you know, activity starts to pick up, uh, their business could pick up too. And yet uh, we saw yesterday that their cancellations are still outpacing sales. So what is the case to get into Boeing at this price point now? It, is it a purely valuation play or uh, do you see more upside that maybe uh, it is not ha that has not surfaced yet? Right. So Kiko, the note is around this idea of surprises. And I think kind of as you're underscoring, it'd be a real surprise if Boeing could finally put the 737 MAX, some of the other challenges it faces behind it, it's really struggled to do that. So the whole kind of outlook in terms of uh, aerospace and defense is this idea that they are unloved, creating a compelling valuation opportunity, that they've underperformed. So not only as Boeing, but the category has underperformed markets pretty notably over the last 12 months. Funds that track uh, aerospace and defense indexes have seen outflows. So again, signaling that they're unloved. So my view is, is that you don't need much of a callus to get it going. So if the economy does rebound, we get some of this unleashed uh, demand from the pandemic leaving us, you could just see some modest increases. And that alone could do well. What's really interesting is in his first year of his first term, Obama was certainly focused on the global financial crisis and other domestic priorities. And yet the aerospace and defense index, which it includes Boeing, obviously, outperformed the market by more than 4% that year. So I'm just taking a similar leap of faith that this unloved, compelling value could surprise on the upside as the economy rebounds. Okay, well, we'll have to check in with you a little later down the line in the year to see whether those surprises materialize. Michael Roney, Chief Investment Strategist, at U.S. Fighter Business at State Street Global Advisors. It's good to talk to you today.